Now, what is glycine? So glycine was the very first amino acid isolated from protein. A French chemist by the name of Henry, I'm gonna mangle his name, but we'll give it a shot, Bracanot, obtained it in the 1820s, or in 1820 by hydrolyzing gelatin. Later chemists clarified its nitrogen content and gave it the modern name from the Greek for sweet, hence glycine. Now it's the smallest amino acid of all 20 that we have, and it's non-essential, or classically considered non-essential, which is unique because it makes up 11.5% of the total amino acids in the body. So even though there are 20 of them, this one makes up almost 12%, and it's considered non-essential. Now, you'll see this term a lot with amino acids, conditionally essential, meaning if under certain circumstances or conditions, we need to eat more of it than our body can produce, and that's also true of glycine. And one of the things that makes it unique is it has a what's known as a non-chiral structure. So it, it helps create forms or bends in proteins because it doesn't have uh, this large or obtuse arm sticking off of the side of it. Molecularly speaking, it's great for helping proteins bend. Now, it compromises 35% of all of the amino acids in collagen, and it's very critical for the formation of collagen. As a matter of fact, without it, that triple helix of collagen uh, wouldn't be saturated and it would break more readily and deteriorate more rapidly. It's why one of the best food sources for glycine is actually collagen-rich foods like chicken skin or bone broth. Now, if we look at some of its functions, uh, glycine plays such a central role in biochemistry in humans. Here are some of the basic functions. One in protein and connective tissue, and then as I mentioned before, this plays a role with the collagen, detoxification, and the liver, but also um, it, it does some of its own detoxification, which we'll talk about. It plays a role in helping you metabolize folate, which is vitamin B9. It plays a role in the production of proteins called porphyrins, which we'll talk about shortly. It helps to conjugate bile acids along with taurine, so the two amino acids that are responsible for helping you properly produce bile acids, glycine being one of them. It, it helps to make creatine. If you have recalled, creatine is very popular these days. If you haven't watched my crash course on creatine, I highly encourage you to do so, but you can't make it in your body without glycine. And then it also plays a role in nerve signaling or neural signaling. Now, let's dive into these things a little bit deeper. I'll give you some visuals to look at. So when I said glycine is very central um, in biochemistry, if you look at this particular diagram, you'll see at its core you have glycine, and then from glycine you can make so many other different things. One of the things that's unique about glycine is it can go back and forth between serine. So serine being another amino acid, if you haven't watched my crash course on serine, and you wanna learn more about it and their role together, I'd, I'd encourage you to watch that. But glycine can turn into serine and serine can also turn into glycine. And glycine makes creatine bile salts proteins called porphyrins. These are special cage-like structures that are necessary to make hemoglobin. Now, why is that so important? Hemoglobin is that protein inside your red blood cells. So you know, your red blood cells are kind of shaped like a, a biconcave disc, and then you have this structural cage in the inside um, where you have an iron attached. That's that protein's called a hemoglobin, and that's so that your red blood cells can pick up oxygen and carbon dioxide. But that structure of hemoglobin, which is made out of porphyrin, you can't produce that without glycine. So this is where, uh, gly when, if glycine is low or you're on a low protein diet, this is one of the things that can actually contribute to the, um, the anemic state. Now we know there's also porphyrin-based compounds like cytochrome. Now cytochrome P450, is one of the main agents in your liver that's responsible for detox or detoxification. And without glycine, it can't be produced. Now, glycine also is responsible in part for the making of glutathione. Now, glutathione is 
what's sometimes referred to as a tripeptide. Um, it has, it's made of three amino acids. It's made out of glycine, of course, but it's also, we need cysteine and glutamate, which comes from glutamine. So the combination of these three amino acids is what builds glutathione. And of course, glutathione's main function, or one of its main functions, is it helps the liver to, um, to detoxify glutathione conjugates. It helps break down toxic compounds through the liver. It also helps as a strong antioxidant. One of glutathione's other functions is it can help recycle other antioxidants, um, primarily vitamin C. So as your body uses and burns through vitamin C, glutathione helps to basically recycle it and reuse it again. And we can't make glutathione without glycine. Now it's one of its other roles is in the production of collagen, elastin, and other proteins. So if you struggle with a lot of joint pain or you're prone to injury, strains and sprains, one of the best things you can do is check your diet first. You might not be eating enough protein. A lot of people follow a lower protein diet. There's, a, there's definitely a protein phobia in the US. And you know one of the th things about glycine is it predominantly comes from collagen-rich foods. So if you're eating predominantly vegetables, not a tremendous amount of glycine um, in that. And then if you put your body under any demand, any, other, any kind of physical demand where you're needing to break down muscle tissue, rebuild it, collagen or elastin, other proteins, that in and of itself is going to potentially create a problem for you. Now, one of the other functions of glycine, as serine converts to glycine, it actually helps to activate vitamin B9 which is, which is what this little mechanism is all about. And that's, that's folate, if you've heard of folate before. And folate plays a role in this process called methylation, which is very central to detoxification, but also it's very central to making thymine and purines, which are important for cellular growth, the production of nucleic acids, DNA, so that you can build and make new cells. And so without these agents, um, it's very, very challenging and very, very difficult to heal. So glycine plays with folate to make that happen. So you can see a lot of different functions because of its central role that it plays. Now, we blow this one up. You can see a little bit more for those of you who are visual learners. Similar here, but um, we've got glycine and its biochemical derivative pathway. So we'll walk you through some of this without trying to be too complex. Now, one of the places we get glycine, you can see here, is in high protein foods. Our body can also synthesize glycine and, and, and that's from other ingredients. So one of the things that we can actually make glycine from, as I mentioned a moment ago, is serine. But serine being an amino acid, we can also make glycine from threonine, which is an essential amino acid. So these two amino acids can help us make glycine internally. Now we can also make glycine from choline and from betaine. So eating, obviously eating foods rich in, in these items is going to help with that glycine pool. Now, like I said earlier, if you're on a low protein diet, this is where you might struggle, like I said, especially if you are doing any kind of physical activity, trying to work out, trying to exercise at all. Very, very important that you have adequate protein to meet that demand. Now, additionally, so we, as we follow this pathway, so you see glycine can make serine, and then we can use serine to make something called pyruvate. Now, what is pyruvate? It's one of the primary ingredients that helps basically make ATP. So your body will take pyruvate and it uses that particular compound. It's a central compound in the production of ATP, which is energy, right? And so cellular energy, it's how your, your cells produce energy to do the work that they need to do. As I mentioned before, um, in this step for glycine to serine, this, the folate activation 
is in that step, and this is what helps us make DNA and RNA so that we can make new cells and repair, um, repair tissue. We've got glycine playing a major role. It is the primary amino acid in collagen by about 30%. And then I mentioned porphyrin a moment ago. Now, it said porphyrin was like a cage. This is the cage of porphyrins. If you put an iron in the middle of it, that's hemoglobin. And so that's what goes inside of your red blood cells and helps you carry oxygen. And then we've got bile acids are, are produced and conjugated by glycine. So if you understand what a bile acid is, so your liver makes bile and then it stores that bile in your gallbladder. You can see it here. So this structure here is your liver and then your gallbladder, this little green sac that kind of sits underneath there in your liver. And so as your liver's producing bile acids, you, you know, glycine or taurine, as I mentioned, glycine helps to conjugate those bile acids into their active versions. And so what happens then is we secrete those bile acids into the small intestine where they bind to fats. And this is in part how we emulsify fat and absorb fat. So without this in place, fat malabsorption can be a consequence. So in, in a sense, you could say that glycine is critical for fat absorption. And so glycine, low protein diets, and this is, this is one of the things that we see when people avoid eating animal protein altogether, and then they try to bring it back in their diet. They're so malnourished in amino acids like glycine and taurine, they can't properly produce bile. And so then they have a hard time eating any kind of fat. And so when they increase or incorporate more animal fats in their diet, they get nauseous, they get stomach aches. And this is one of those things, you've gotta get the level of these amino acids up well enough to generate that bile so that you can properly absorb that fat without it causing irritation. Now, one of the things about bile acids is they get reused. You can see 95% of bile acids, once they're excreted in the duodenum, as they go through your intestine, that 95% of them get reabsorbed in the distal small intestine and get reutilized, and about 5% of them come out in your stool, in your fecal uh, material. Now, that's an important element of detox. Um, when you talk about mold toxins, um, bile acid plays a critical role in, in binding them up and, and, and allowing you to reabsorb them. Um, okay, next let's talk about creatine. So one of the other fates of, bio, or of glycine is this chemical here called sarcosine, which is a precursor to creatine. Um, so glycine combined with arginine and other amino acid together build creatine. And if you've learned much about creatine, creatine is a secondary energy system predominantly for your muscle, although they're finding now with new research that creatine can be beneficial in cognitive decline. It can help, uh, especially the elderly, have better memories and cognitive function. But creatine is used, it's, a, it's in the muscle, so when your muscle um, runs out of oxygen, if you ever lift weights and you get into a state of something called anaerobic metabolism where, where you start to feel that burning in your muscle, creatine is there as an extra source of energy to allow you to continue to work with less burn. So creatine allows you to have a, a few extra seconds of stronger energy or better energy when you're trying to work out. And for many people, that makes a tremendous difference. It's been around as a supplement for many, many decades uh, it's actually one of the most successful ergogenic supplements that a person can take to enhance strength, athletic performance. But you make it internally from glycine. Now, we also know that glycine, one of the fates of glycine um, can also be glucose. We know that one of the fates can be something called glyoxalate. And so many of you think an oxalate, where's that? That term sounds familiar, oxalate. Yes, oxalate, oxalic acid. And there's, sometimes oxalates get a bad rap because um, there's a lot of hype around oxalates being unhealthy or being bad for people, but oxalate metabolism is in all humans. We all have the ability to make them. Um, glycine can, make, can turn into oxalate 
Uh, vitamin C can turn into oxalate and vice versa. Oxalate can turn into glyoxalate and become a source of glycine. So that, that goes both ways. So um, your body's pretty smart about it and it will convert it as it needs it. Ultimately, bottom line is lots of different roles or mechanisms for glycine. The way we get it predominantly is through diet, but we can also synthesize it internally from our own uh, serine, choline, or threonine. Of course, how do we get these things? We get these things through diet as well. So ultimately, it's best to eat foods that contain enough protein, adequate amounts of protein, that we can have healthy stores of this amino acid. Now, one of its other functions I mentioned a moment ago is as a neuromodulator, it regulates nervous system function. And this is um, a relatively new discovery. They, they discovered not very long ago this, this receptor in the body, and they, it, it was named a glycine receptor. It's a very unique receptor that glycine will attach to. And so what it does is it allows the influx of chloride molecules into the cell that you get a hyperpolarization which blocks calcium influx. And, and so in, in certain types of immune cells, this is where this is important because certain immune cells, um, that calcium influx will stimulate inflammatory chemicals like TNF-alpha. And this is associated with or linked to many types of chronic inflammatory diseases. And so what we believe is that glycine plays a role in helping to modulate the diseases of, of non-traumatic slow inflammation. So think arthritis, think autoimmune conditions with an inflammatory backdrop. So glycine is a neurotransmitter modulator that helps to reduce a premature stimulation or an overtly aggressive stimulation of nerve tissue to release inflammatory chemicals.